Okay. Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Daniel Garcia, and I am here today to try to give you some tips or about what is going. We expect to be contact in the next version of C++. Hopefully, we will be on time for C++ 20. So if you want to, to get the slides, they are in my, my home page and they will be also in the ACCU uh, site. So let me briefly introduce myself. I'm a C++ programmer. I started writing C++ code in 1989, some time ago. Then I promise you my hair was not white. And I am an associate professor in computer architecture in University Carlos III in Madrid. And part time, I am also a member of the ISO C++ Standards Committee. I, will be, I have been around there for the last 10 years. And I have some goals of what can I do for, for developers. I started focusing in performance, so trying to help people to write uh, faster applications. That uh, at some point a few years ago, we saw that it's not all about being fast, but also it's becoming increasingly important to be energy efficient. So it's not only faster applications, but better performance per watt. Uh, I'm also uh, concerned about maintainability because having fast code that nobody can maintain is something not so interesting. And uh, software tends to outlive hardware and software sometimes tends uh, to outlive programmers too. Like 20 years ago, I was in a project in a major telecommunication company in Spain. And we were analyzing some code. And then one of the persons in my team told, look, this comment was written by my father. <laughs> so maintainability really matters. And lately, I got interested in reliability, in helping people to write safer software component, which has been a challenge, I think, from day one in computing, and still it's a challenge. Uh, my university is a young university. It was founded in 1989. And I work in a group that originally was a high performance uh, computing group, and we do some other things. And I am focused in programming models for application improvement. And I don't matter if application improvement is today being faster or being more energy efficient or being more maintainable or whatever, making applications better. I have been leading a uh, an European project, and I'm working another one uh, right now. And as I said, we also belong to the ISO C++ Standards Committee. So let me start with a very brief history about uh, contact programming. So first question is, what's correctness? Well, I like a lot this quote. If it doesn't have to produce the correct results, I can make it arbitrarily fast. So this is why I started uh, thinking about correctness, because I was so focused in making it fast that at some point I say, hey, it must be correct too. Uh, that's a pity. Uh, this other quote is for Bertrand Meyer, uh, now as one of the pioneers in design by contact. Uh, correctness is clearly the prime quality. If a system does not do what it is supposed to do, 
then everything else about it matters little. Although uh, Bertrand Meyer is uh, usually cited as one of the, of the pioneers in design by contact, uh, design by contact ba goes back uh, to the early 70s. The first uh, thing that comes to my mind is Tony Hoare's work in the very early 70s and then in the 90s also Barbara Liskov. But if you look, uh, if you Google about design by contact, you are going to find a lot of things from Bertrand Meyer and the Eiffel programming language. How many of you have heard of Eiffel? Okay, good to know. How many of you think Eiffel is a good language you would like to write software for? Really? Okay. So Eiffel has a great ideas, but my concern about Eiffel is the other part. I want to write correct software that is fast. And uh, typically, uh, Eiffel is not the, the best example of uh, giving you the ability to write fast software. So why are we here? Because we are concerned about writing correct software. And uh, for doing that, isn't a library solution enough? Well, there have been a number of library solutions around uh, for a long time. The very first one for C and C++ is the assert macro. And you write your uh, assertions. Well, not so useful. I mean, you can write your assertions and if something bad happens, you will get uh, notified that something bad happened, but you cannot do that much. So we already tried that in a number of ways. Uh, one problem with any library solution or library only solution is that uh, compilers and uh, static analyzers do not understand the approach. They cannot uh, go and see your assertions and reason about your code based on your assertions because they are just, in the best case, function calls. In the worst case, even worse, macros. So you cannot do that much with that. And what did others do? We already know all of us that Eiffel did a language solution with uh, very nice ideas. You will see that we, what we are proposing for C++ is not so nice at this stage. So it's, you may see easily that it will be a subset of that. But there are other solutions, uh, language solutions there. The D language has uh, contacts. And uh, I don't know if many of you are aware, but today, the ADA language has a, a language solution for contact-based uh, programming. This was part of ADA 2012 uh, ISO standard and is uh, based a lot in the experience, uh, experience of a product called Spark uh, that uh, provides you with the means to perform formal verification in constrained ADA uh, programs where safety criticality is really priority uh, number one. And this was experimented for a number of years in Spark and now is part of ADA 2012. I think it's quite interesting, probably the only thing I don't really like is that the notification mechanism when a contact is broken is throwing an exception. And I do not have anything against exception except that in some domains, 
for different reasons, you are not allowed to use exceptions. Uh, so uh, how many of you cannot use exceptions in your uh, current job? Okay, so throwing an exception is a concern for some of you. So this was a, a, a difficult point. What could we do for context programming without forcing you to use exceptions? By the way, C-sharp has had uh, several experiences on uh, contact programming too. The most recent uh, of them, I think, is code contacts. So there are, there are enough experience in other programming languages. So I did a bit of archaeology about C++. The first proposal for adding context programming dates back, at least that I am aware of, to year 2005. Uh, that was a proposal uh, by uh, Thorsten Ottosen, and then elaborated a little bit more, but uh, the proposal evaporated. One of the reasons is that, by, as you may know, by year 2005, C++ OX was almost done. Sing it? So they didn't want to delay with additional features, and they got delayed by many other things anyway. But after that, this uh, proposal, no, nobody no longer worked on it. And then in year 2013, there was a proposal by John Lakos and Alexei Zakharov. By the way, John, John is over there. Uh, there was a proposal for centralized defensive programming support for narrow contacts that was discussed uh, that year. After that, we had additional proposals with uh, different ideas during years 2014 and 2015. And we had a lot of discussions in the Standards Committee. Finally, in 2016, we got to a first joint proposal trying to consider different trade-offs of uh, different development uh, communities and co-authored, I co-authored that proposal with Gabriel Dos Reyes, John Lakos, Alistair Meredith, Nathan Myers, and Björn Sturstrup, and many, many other people provided ideas and uh, feedback and uh, raised concerns of things we didn't consider. And right now, we hope that we are targeting C++ 20 with the current proposal. So let me, before going to the syntax that I'm sure is something you want to see, let me uh, give some personal view about uh, correctness. So to make it clear, when I go to syntax and to the details, this is a, a joint uh, common effort in this part, probably, you will see some things that reflect my personal view and that does not necessarily is shared by everybody. But in my view, when I design a library, there are two related properties that uh, I need to consider. One is robustness and the other one is correctness. They are a uh, Tightly tied, but they are not the same thing. So correctness is, for me, the degree to which a software component matches its specification. Or if you want to put in more simple words, is does it has a programming mistake, or did I write the software correctly? while robustness is the ability of a software component to react to abnormal conditions. So robustness has nothing to do on how good programmer I am. It has to do with, am I able to react when my hard disk is broken or when I lost my network connection? Still there are things that are going to happen and the most perfect 
uh, program needs to react to those situations. The thing is that today, in many libraries, we use a single mechanism for handling both situations. We use, we use exception handling for both, for correctness and robustness. I claim, and this is my personal view, that these two mechanisms, sh these two uh, aspects of software should be handled independently because they are orthogonal properties of the software. So when a failure happens, we use exceptions as an error reporting mechanism. Okay, we have been doing that for a long time and uh, if you are not allowed to use exceptions, you, I'm sorry for you, but you can use uh, other things. Uh, probably you have to write a bit more of boilerplate code, but I, I understand the reasons why in many domains you are not allowed to use uh, exceptions. But anyway, we notify that an error has occurred and that it needs, needs to be handled somewhere. So we, what we are doing is trying to decouple the error identification that happens in one software component from the error handling that happens in a different place, probably at, uh, at, at upper level in the call hierarchy. Uh, an example of a failure is badalock. I'm trying to allocate memory and unfortunately I cannot get memory. Okay, that's a failure. When a different thing is when a library detects that an assumption was not met and it needs a mechanism to react. Let's say I have my wonderful square root function and my expectation as a library developer is that you are going to give me non-negative numbers as an input. Okay, this has nothing to do with external conditions like the hard disk is broken. This has to do that you as a programmer that are, is using my library, you are not meeting my expectations. And then we are in what we call a contact violation. The contact between you and me has been broken. So what do we do today if you look at many libraries when a contact is broken? Well, many, many times what we do is just ignore reality. Okay, bad luck, something bad is going to happen, I don't know. This happens a lot. Well, some people improve the situation a little bit with documentation. Okay, you are not expected to give me a negative number. Ah, and if I do? Well, sometimes we throw exceptions or we give a, an error code that probably you might handle or you might not handle. So as I said, robustness and correctness are orthogonal properties and should be managed independently. So robustness is identification and handling of abnormal situations. Those situations, let me insist, that occur in completely correct programs. The most perfect program in the world still needs to, needs to handle these kind of situations. As I cannot allocate memory. You might eventually recover from a robustness issue in some way. Well, sometimes the only thing that you can do is a graceful shutdown and at least make sure that you don't save any corrupt file and that you will be able to restart when the sun is shining. 
and sometimes you can uh, you can recover in in other ways. Uh, for example, you were not able to connect to the network, still you can work locally. Okay. So you can do some things. A typical question at this point is: Is end of file a robustness issue? This is something that uh, people discuss a lot, and you will find some programming language that it's not in my favorite list that has an exception for end of file. Now, my definition is that exceptions are for abnormal situations, abnormal and unexpected situations. So, you open a file, you read the first byte, you read the next byte, you read the next byte, and are you going to tell me that you got surprised because you got to end of file? Really, you didn't expect that sooner or later you were going to get to end of file? Is this something abnormal or is completely normal? I'm sorry, it's completely normal. It is just a different state in your program. That's it. So abnormal needs to be something really abnormal. Yeah. This is just for you. So for you have a compiler, you have a compiler, and I put in a, a bad program that doesn't, it, it, it's exactly correct. Does the compiler throw an exception? I never get my code wrong, never. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't, th I, I, I don't think uh, it should be an exception. You will get a different output. That's a different, a different thing. That was a softball. Yeah. Uh, in this case, if you're, if you're given an incorrect file, it will corrupt it, basically. So it says in the header that the file has specific size and to read the date structure that's stored within it, you're supposed to read 20 bytes, but after the 10th one, you find the end of the file, and you fail to read further. Is this an abnormal situation, or? I, I think that your client is not meeting the contact. So it's not an abnormal situation. Okay, more questions? Okay, so the C++ standard library identifies those cases uh, by specifying what is the condition firing the situation and the exception that will be thrown to notify. And as an example, you have in the allocator library, allocate, and the documentation or the specification of the standard library states throws but alloc if storage cannot be obtained. Okay, this is the way we do in the standard library. Now, Let's go to correctness, which is our uh, real issue. So correctness is about finding programming errors. Yes, sometimes some of us make programming errors. Not every day, yeah? Uh, so who's guilty? Well, a contract is broken because one, a caller does not fulfill the expectations before calling the function. Or a, a colleague does not fulfill what should be ensured after its own execution. So we have a key difference with robustness. A program failure is usually due to external conditions and cannot be avoided while a contact violation should never happen in a correct program. So how do we handle correctness in the C++ standard library? We have a general statement in the library part of the standard that says that violation of preconditions specified in a function's requires paragraph results in undefined behavior unless the function's throws paragraph specifies throwing an exception when the precondition is violated. <laughs> so basically, 
In practice, there are two approaches that you will find in the standard library. Sometimes, do nothing. That is undefined behavior. <coughs> and sometimes, notify by throwing an exception. Can we do it a little bit better? For example, can we do more than just runtime checks? Because if the only thing I want is runtime checks, then probably a library solution is sufficient. So go back, use your assert macro, and you are done. If you are here, probably you want more than that. Can we use context information for optimizing out code? Sometimes we can. Later I will show a, a very simple example that we can do that because we put the context as part of the language. Uh, a different question is, should we? It depends the kind of software you are writing. You should or you shouldn't. Typically, in very uh, safety-critical software, sometimes you don't want to. But in many cases, it's the right thing to do. Can we make our semantics available to external, tool, ex external tools, not only the compiler? Static analyzers and other tools managing in the code. For this, again, I need to express the things so that they are at the language level and not at the library level. Can we avoid the command code sync issue? Peter Sommerlad was uh, claiming yesterday that we should not write uh, so many commands and that we should be able to express as much as possible our, our ideas into code. So having this as a language feature will allow me to move things that today I have in commands to places that are parsed by the compiler and other tools. Can we learn from experiences in other programming languages? Well, we have tried to. We have tried to look at different programming languages and what they were doing for supporting context uh, programming, but we didn't copy what was in any other programming languages because, you know, this is C++. It's a complex language with a lot of different things that you will not be able to find in any other language. And can we serve different communities with different needs? This is a feature that when you tell people, eh, we are going to support design by contract, everybody says, cool. But then when you go to the details and w you talk to a video game programmer and an embedded systems programmer and a safety critical programmer or a financial industrial programmer, they need not exactly the same thing. So if you see that some of the things we are proposing you would like more, for this first version of design by contract, we are trying to provide something that is useful to almost everybody and that has nothing that is uh, bad for anybody and then let's try to get experience and uh, finally to add more advanced features that many of you want. So look at what I am going to present as a minimal proposal on top of which we will try to build more things later. So, you want to see the thing, yeah? So, in our proposal, a contact is the set of preconditions, postconditions, and assertions that are associated to a function. Preconditions, postconditions, and also assertions. A precondition states what are the expectations of the function. What are the expectations of the, uh, of the function in terms of what you are providing to the function and the uh, global program state? While the post condition states what must the function ensure on termination? 
And we also have assertions where, which are predicates that must be satisfied at some point in a function body, at some point in a program. <coughs> so basically, a contact states rights and obligations of cl a client software component and a supplier software component. <coughs> so let's start with preconditions. So a precondition is a predicate that should hold, hold upon entry into a function and expresses the function's expectation on its arguments and or a state of objects that may be or might be used by the function. For this, we introduce a new attribute called expects because they are our expectations. So here you have a possible uh, square root function taking a double and here you have an attribute expects colon and a boolean expression. Okay, this is not the usual attribute syntax because in C++ 11 and even in C++ 14 and 17, an attribute either has no argument or if it has a number of arguments, you will use parentheses. Parentheses, okay? So because of this, uh, in this case, we think we'll go against readability. We add a new syntax for attributes, which is attribute, colon, and then you have a logical expression. <coughs> or here are, uh, you have the class Q, and you have uh, the member function push, and my expectation is that the queue is not full. If you want to push, the queue should not be full. So as I said, preconditions use a modified attribute syntax and the expectation is part of the function declaration. So you put your expectations, your preconditions when you declare the function. We have the equivalent for post conditions that are predicates that, predicates that should hold on exit from the function. And they express the conditions that a function should ensure for the return value and or the state of objects that may be used by the function. Post conditions are expressed by another attribute called ensures. <coughs> so here you have another version of square root and I expect that the input value x is greater or equal than zero and for post conditions, we allow a post condition to introduce a name for the result of the function, for the return value of the function. So after ensures and before the column, you may write any identifier. You introduce a new identifier. And this is the identifier that we are going to use for the return value of the function. What is the type of this identifier? Clearly, the return type from the function. And then you can use this new identifier result in this case in your Boolean expression. So here I am stating that the result of square root is greater or equal than zero. So we, we discuss other alternatives, but uh, any of them we found some problems and finally we decided that the easier and more flexible solution is that the programmer may decide what name he wants to give to the result value. So you have preconditions and you have post conditions. Details will come later. You also have assertions. An assertion is a predicate that should hold at its point in a function body, wherever. And express a, a condition that must be satisfied 
on objects that are accessible at its point in the body. And for this, we introduce a new attribute called assert. Do not confuse with the assert macro. So here I, you have an example. Here I have a function at distances that takes a vector of doubles and that assumes that all the doubles in the vector are non-negative. And while I am computing the addition, sorry Peter, by writing, writing an explicit loop, uh, you may assert that each individual value is non-negative. So you can put asserts wherever in the code where you, in the old days, used the assert macro. Now you can use the assert attribute. So what's the difference between the assert macro and the assert attribute? The most important difference is that this is a language feature and not a library feature. And because of this, the compiler can use this information to reason about your code. Yep. Well, uh, you could, for example, use a lambda, and you will see later that you can set a precondition or a postcondition associated to a lambda, and then you would be done. Peter? To the declaration uh, of x, no, be, because uh, this is this attribute, this special attribute is attached to an executable sentence. So in this case, is the uh, the semicolon one. So do we need the semicolon there or not? Uh, no, and then the attribute would be associated to this other uh, uh, sentence. But you can use the semicolon, and sometimes it is easier to read the code in that way. Uh, this is not an issue. Did I answer? So you're saying I cannot write a declaration, so the value would not no. be there. No. Um, by using the token assert, doesn't that mean you are going to conflict with the C macro name? No. Mm, no. <coughs> no. <be> <laughs> No, no, we, we, we had a look to that problem and we made sure that you are not going to conflict because if it is the assert macro, you would expect here a parenthesis and not a column. No, but when the preprocessor runs first and performs the substitution, then when the compiler gets to the compiler, isn't it going to see a problem? Uh, I think no, but we have an implementer over there that can confirm my expectation. So uh, uh, I believe a compiler implementer. <laughs> yep? Uh, I will handle inheritance later. <laughs> you put some code in a slide. <laughs> OK. Yes. If you, since it's uh, expects not ensures, what does R refers to? Uh, this is a mistake by myself. Oh, okay. That should be ensures. Okay. Sorry. Are you going to get around to how you handle class invariants later on? Or is, is that not the in, in, uh, sorry. Class invariants. We don't have class invariants. For now, we don't. Uh, as I said, this is a minimal proposal. Uh, we would li I would like to have class invariants and loop invariants and many other things, but not for now. 
He's waiting for a long time. No, this, this is ensures. This is. Um, Uh, okay, okay, but uh, here you are in a different context, so uh, that should not be any problem, but could be resolved uh, Z or whatever. But because here you are in the declaration and not in the definition, it's not a problem that you use the same identifier here and here or that you use completely different identifiers. Yes, but if you feel happier, we can use a different name there. Yep. You do solve expectations applied to methods and constructors as well? Yes. Well, uh, well, the pr the problem is that sometimes if you write if you write as an expect, it's going to give you a higher computational cost that is if you uh, compute as you go. Uh, did did I make clear? Because if you write here, you could use an expect uh, with some for each or something li like that, but then. Uh, what uh, what happens is that you traverse the full array for uh, computing the precondition, and then you are going to traverse it again. So sometimes this is one of the reasons why we have assertions also, and not only precondition and postconditions, because sometimes it will be cheaper to compute as you go. Where, where we, we will decide when we make the lookup, and we will make the lookup for some globals after the column. Done. So let me go on a little bit uh, so, uh, so I can show you something else. Uh, anyway, I have only 50 something slides, so we will have more time to, to discuss for sure. Uh, so, effects of contacts. A contact has no observable effect on a correct program, let me stress, on a correct program except performance. So, if your program is correct, no precondition, postcondition, or assertion would be violated. So, the only difference that you would see in the program with contacts and without context is that probably is a bit slower. That's the only difference. As I said, on a correct program. <coughs> so the only semantic effect of a contact happens if some contact is broken. If no contact is broken, there is no semantic difference. And this is one of the reasons why, finally, after exploring a lot of different syntaxes, we decided to go for attributes. Now, we use attributes, and contacts may be checked or not. We will see later how you select, you want to check or you don't want to check uh, the contacts. Another good thing is that because we use attributes, the contacts are not part of the function's type. Okay, they are annotations on the declaration. However, contacts are not an optional feature. If we get this in the standard, if we get contacts standardized, they are a mandatory feature 
as any other standardized, con uh, standardized attribute. You have the not return attribute and it's not optional to implement it. It's part of the standard. So uh, I wanted to make clear the, uh, this point. Context checking and the effects depend on some build system settings. And this is the first time in the C++ standard that we are going to say something about the build process. This is a change because when you read the standard up to now, we do not say anything about build options. And now we will be saying something about the build options. So the default, if you take all the defaults, the easy way, all by default, a contact violation results in program termination. Now, you may think this is too hard. So we have some things to make it different. But by the default, that's it. Because after all, if a contact gets violated, if a contact gets broken, it is because your program is broken. And the best thing I can do with a broken program is shut down. You are in an unsafe mode. Then we can discuss other things that we can do. It's not the only option. Yeah, so currently the standard, like the, the FTS functions, they specify preconditions. And if you fail to specify those preconditions, then there is a throws clause that says I'm, pr I'm throwing an exception. Does it mean that when I fail to satisfy the contact, uh, that's not a, a precondition violation? Like, uh, will the standard terminate the program in that case? Or how is that? What? Well, once we, we have uh, all the, uh, the contact uh, language part specified, we will need to enter into specifying the standard library and make some changes. So one thing is what I would ideally do with the standard library, but unfortunately, a different thing is what I will need to do because of backward compatibility. I cannot change the behavior of the standard library. So we, we need, and we will need to analyze this uh, case by case. Yes, yes, we, we, because sometimes today we are throwing exceptions for things that are contracts. Right. Uh, and uh, changing that behavior uh, is something risky because some people is already relying on this behavior. Let, let me give you a very simple example. We have the add function in std vector, which throws out of range if you provide an index out of the range of the vector. On my view, this should have a contact with the expectation that the index is in range. But this would change the existing behavior today of the standard library. I don't think we should do that for uh, that library in particular. Did I answer? Yeah, more or less. Okay. Yep. But for every condition violation, it will go in an undefined behavior in the standard library. Because Not always. That's the problem. Yeah, I'm saying for all of them. Uh, for, for those that have undefined behavior. Can you safely have them behave as if a contract was violated? Yes, I think so. For those that are the undefined behavior, yes. Okay. Let me go one, uh, well, last question and next slide. Uh, if someone makes a contract and terminates your program, how do you write the unit test to say that your, your preconditions and your postconditions are roughly the unit test you're going to write? Uh, ah. I could not hear everything, uh, but, it, but if I assume that the question is if I would like to do something different than just program termination, then you need to wait two slides. And I'm going for the first one. So first, uh, perhaps it's three, I, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, first thing about uh, contacts in the declaration. Any redeclaration of a function has either the same contact or completely omits the contact. So basically you write a function and then you annotate the contact and then later you can write the function without any contact. Okay, no problem. 
we assume that the contract is the same. So you only need to state explicitly the contract in the first declaration of the function. Now, what you cannot do is later write a declaration of the function with a different contract. Okay? Uh, because in the first one, uh, you are saying that you expect x greater than zero and uh, result greater than zero. And here you are saying nothing about the result and x you are asking greater or equal than zero. That's different. No. No, you can't. And uh, here I'm writing other, uh, again the same contract. So that's not, uh, not a problem. Now. Say that what I would expect of most people to do is in the header file to write the contacts. And then in the implementation file, you don't need to repeat again the contact. Just to make your life uh, as a programmer easy. If you want to repeat, you are on your, right, uh, on your right to repeat it, but you are not required to repeat the contact. Anyway. When you repeat the contact, names might differ. For example, here I'm, I'm using x as an argument, and here I'm using y. So here the context is x greater than 0, y greater than 0. That's the same contact. You have changed the name, but that's uh, nothing relevant. And the same happens with the return value. Here I named r, and here I named z. That's not a problem. Now. Let's talk about checking. Every contact expression has an associated assertion level. You didn't see the assertion level because if you don't say anything, your assertion level is default. But we have, in fact, three assertion levels, default, audit, and axiom. Only those three. And then the checking of the contract will be performed or not depending on your assertion level and the build mode that you compile your program. So if you say nothing, it's as if you said expect default. So it's assertion level default. You are. Uh, you should use or you are expected uh, to use the assertion level default for those checks that uh, have a low or a small computational cost, at least compared to the cost the function you are annotating. If you have more expensive, co uh, more expensive uh, precondition or postconditions, then you can use audit. It's an assertion level expected to be used in cases where the cost of a runtime check is assumed to be large compared with function execution. Here, for example, we have a binary search. And a precondition that I might think of is, OK, if I am performing a binary search on a range, the range should be sorted. OK. Now, what is the complexity of binary search? Typically, it's logarithmic. What is the complexity of checking that a range is sorted? Typically, it's linear. So this is a good case for performing an audit check. It's going to be expensive. But in some super safe mode, perhaps I want to check it anyway. So this. This is why I mark this check as audit. Still, I have another level, axiom, which might be surprising at the beginning. Axiom is a assertion level that will be never checked. Never. I will never generate executable code for an axiom check I don't mind what options in the compiler you set. I'm not going to check this. 
So, but still, the predicate you write in an axiom a check needs to be valid C++ code. So what's the use? First, you can see this as for a formal command, a command that is valid C++. Okay. And second, and probably more important, is that, okay, this is not going uh, to generate code for checking, but uh, still this is information that I am giving to a static analyzer, and this is even information that I am giving to the compiler and that the compiler can use to reason about my code and eventually perform optimizations. So here you have an example of some potential algorithm where I am requiring that first is different from last and that first is reachable from last. Whatever reachable means. In fact, reachable in this case is a function that is, needs to be declared, but I don't mind if you have defined it or not. Okay, still this information, if I don't define the information, probably the only thing it is useful is a formal documentation. Okay, now, if I also define the function, I am giving very good information to a static analyzer. So, so, the, the, so the, 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 question, uh, the question is, if the compiler can prove that you are going to violate uh, a contract, can the compiler reject the program? Can I just uh, stop compilation? And yes, yes. Be, uh, be, uh, as today, we can discuss if that would be a warning or a hard error. But as today, when the, program, uh, when the compiler can prove by its own means that you are going to violate some very basic uh, uh, contact from the type system, it will give you today a warning. And if you are compiling with, as I do, with warning, all warnings are errors, you're done. Yes. Okay, now we had, uh, after this slide, please. Uh, you have the assertion levels, and now you have, as you were asking in your previous question, the build levels. So when you compile, you can compile with three different levels. Off, I don't want to check anything at all. Or default, please check only the default assertions. Or audit, please check all the default and audit assertions. Okay, so they are cumulative. And we don't have anything to check action assertions. Now, there will be no programmatic way through source code to know which uh, build level you are running or to change it. This is only a compiler flag from your favorite compiler. And this is a good time to take your question or? Sorry? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So I could not hear completely. Your symbol yes, yes, I know my symbol reachable is supposed to be a function. Yes, that's okay. Um, which function? Uh, what name lookable do you use to find it? Well, the same uh, lookup rules that you would use in general. I don't see any specific issue with lookup rules. The lookup rules applied in the context you are. And the context you are is this function declaration. I think the question is more, is it reachable looked up in the function instantiation or in the template instantiated? 
or write a place where the declaration is given? Okay, I, now I see I didn't think of that one. I feel inclined to be in the instantiation. Go on. Uh, what about people using the preprocessor to actually check the, the, um, the levels for checking? Like redefining uh, or using macros in, in, instead if, of actually If you use macros, you are in your own travels. I'm sorry for you. With the pipe processor, you can cheat in a thousand different ways. I cannot do anything for avoiding you to cheat with the pipe processor. The only thing I can do is tell you once and again, don't use the pipe processor. I, I, I mean, you, you, can play, you can play with any keyword in the language with the pipe processor, and I cannot avoid that. Don't use the pipe processor. Okay, I have a slide for that uh, later, and the short answer is you cannot use, at least for this version, in a post condition, any argument that gets modified. Yeah. And you will see the details later. One more? No, it's not part of the signature of the function. That, that is uh, quite important. This is an extra annotation that does not has nothing to do with the function type. I, I think the more detailed question is, what if my call of that algorithm uses an input in a range where reachable is not defined? Uh, then you get a compiler error. I think it's not as fine. Uh, uh, just a clarification. You should think about, uh, about precondition and postconditions of something that originally is in the body of the function and that we extract so that it can be used in the call site and not in the call site. But otherwise, is conceptually part of the implementation. So you cannot play uh, with uh, properties of the function at the call side based on that. Yes. Yes, and, and uh, anyway, we are not going to enforce more than that at the standard level while we expect that build systems enforce consistency. No, we are not going to mandate. I would say I would expect to do so, but this is not mandated. I'm going to defer to John, and then I will answer. Right. If you call something that is out of contract, you should be flawed. <laughs> but instead, it will either be checked or it won't. So there's no side effects. So it doesn't matter what happens. We're already in undefined behavior land, and that we're kind enough to deal with where undefined behavior is a blessing. So if you have a mixed mode build, it may get checked. It may not get 
Well, uh, let, let, me, let me say one thing that would, simpli uh, would simplify. There are noun implementation techniques to avoid duplication of a function just because you want to call this function with checks enabled and disabled. There are implementation techniques for that based on having multiple entry points to a subroutine. So that, that can be done. Okay, let's go on, please. So what happens is if, if a function has multiple, uh, multiple contracts in its interface, well, the evaluation is performed in the order they appear. And this is useful, for example, in this case, where I have two expectations that I write separately. The first one is the pointer you are giving me is not null. And the second one is the value pointed is zero. Well, the second check will be only performed if the first check didn't fail. That means the order of evaluation. So. Can, uh, can we expect the compiler to warn us if we try to run a function in preconditions that could potentially modify the parameters of the function? Uh, we are not requiring, but we are expecting. Because sometimes uh, this is uh, not always solvable. So, but uh, you, uh, let me put in a different way. You are not allowed to write a contact expression which has side effects. As long as you can express this as a predicate, we don't have a special syntax for that. Uh, now, next thing is handling. So I said by default, we terminate the program. But sometimes uh, we want to do something before that. So you may have a contact violation handler. A contact violation handler is just a global function with this signature, return uh, nothing, and take a const ref to a contact violation data structure where you can uh, write what you want to be performed. Uh, if you do not supply a handler, the default handler is abort but you can supply a handler. But there is no programmatic way to set the handler in the source code. This must be set by the build system and no way of asking which is the handler. So you cannot play takes about handlers in your source code. It's an option in your compiler to supply it and we expect that security sensitive systems would prevent that you install an arbitrary handler and will give you only some choices. While in many other uh, situations, you will be able to write your own function and you will be able to supply that function. Uh, this is a function with this specific signature and a content violation is a library facility that has at least the following information. 
the line number, the file name, the function name, and the command. It might be likely that this structure gets simplified by using source location, which is a new class in the library fundamentals TS, today under uh, experimental namespace. So what happens after I execute the violation handler, whatever it is? Well, two basic options. First one, program finishes execution. You run the handler and you finish execution. Second one, program resumes execution. So you run the handler and then you go on. Oh, you have violated a, a contact. The program is in an unknown state. Yes, but sometimes you want to go on anyway. I will give you some example later. An option in your compiler will allow you to set if you want, want to go on or not. So by default, you don't want to go on. You want just to finish. However, you can set it to on to resume execution. Risky, but sometimes uh, you can do it. Remember again, no way of setting through source code and no way of asking the mode. Yeah? Would it be feasible that resume uh, execution time should be thrown in batches? Sometimes yes. And sometimes no. You will see now. But so why do we want to continue? We found some very valid use cases. One use case is gradual introduction of contracts. So let's say that you have a library that today has no contracts at all. And your system works. But you know that while the library is being used, sometimes it gets in some anomalous state. So if you now annotate this library with contracts, things would start to blow up. And you don't want to do this, but you want to introduce contacts. So you introduce contacts, but you set continuation, uh, set on the continuation mode. And then in your handler, you may start logging what's going on to solve the issues. And finally, at the end of the day, you will set continuation off. But this is a way to adapt libraries that are already in production. Another case is testing contacts. So <coughs> if you have your contacts, you want to test them. Now, the way you test a contact is supplying invalid values. And then the contract will be broken. Now, you have your unit test suite, and you don't want for each of these cases to stop uh, the testing process. So this is another case where you want to continue. I know, I know that I am going to break the contract, but this is the right thing here. And a third, probably more arguable case, is some applications that have a plugin structure. So you have a number of plugins up because a contact is uh, broken in one plugin, well, probably you will want to shut down that, pl that plugin, but the rest of the application should go on working. This is another case where perhaps could be useful. For me, the most useful case is the first one. You know, maintainability is something that concerns me a lot. Yep? Uh, that's going to be a very long discussion. Let's not take that one now. Uh, it, I mean, I've been there, we have been discussing many details and it has many dark corners, that, uh, that specific case. Because you, ha you want to think in what would be right in general, but you want to think, as I said before, in backwards compatibility. And both things do not lead you to the same place. No. We will be there someday. 
Yeah. Let's discuss that over dinner and beer. Yeah, that's uh, a good option. Not necessarily because we expect build systems to enforce uh, globally and to have uh, to allow you to have a single global handler. So everyone who's writing plugins for framework has to be following one build setting. Yeah, so and, and, and you can anyway in your in your tooling to check that all has been built with the same uh, setup. Well, not, not your build system, at least your build options. Sorry? Let's say a precondition um, contract violation works. Uh, so, sorry, I cannot hear very well. No, be, be, because there is some background noise. John? I, I cannot hear this gentleman. Yes. And this is, I agree, this is quite risky. Yeah. I, so it, how is that different to protecting if that contract violation might result in a second violation? So y yes, that could happen. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're uh, I, I, as I said, I do not recommend to use it, but there are very specific use cases where that might be a good solution. But for those very specific cases, I would not recommend to use the continuation mode in general, but there are some users that need it, so we provide that option. So for testing, I would expect, for unit testing, I would expect a, a different mode, a throw an exception mode, which is... Well, uh, this is something that you can do because you write your own handler, and in the last line of your handler, you say throw, done. We don't need to provide here an additional compiler option because you can do it in your, in, in, in your handler function. I'm confused then because I thought you said you couldn't set your own handler function. That was just a file. What you're saying in the compiler is which function is going to be run, but not what is in the function, not the implementation of the function. So. Assertion information may also be used by optimizers. So here I have an assertion that the pointer is different from null, and let's say 12 lines later, I have if this if pointer is different from null, do something. Now, uh, a compiler with the proper optimization level could eventually optimize out all this code because a valid program is never going to reach the, uh, here with a pointer different from null. So it can optimize out this kind of code. Now, that is tricky. You want to see the rest of the slide or make the question now? Uh, Okay, yes. Make it equal null, one of them, sorry. Now, if the continuation mode is off, 
then the if sentence is never reached, so no problem at all. Now, if the continuation mode is on, then I would reach to the if sentence, okay? Now, it might be the case that the whole if has been optimized out, and I, I would never execute it. So there is no problem with that because continuation after violation of a contract is technically undefined behavior, sorry. Now, it might be the case that for some specific uh, high integrity systems, you don't want this to happen. And the way you get that is that you disable that optimization. Well, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes it makes sense, sometimes no. So uh, this is at the will of uh, the developer. Sorry. Yeah. No, no, not the compiler vendor because the compiler vendor is going to give you the flags. Now, what happens with no except function if uh, the contact is broken? Well, if the continuation mode is off, the program finishes, as always, no problem. But if the continuation mode is on, the program resumes, okay? No major problem unless the handler throws an exception. If the handler throws an exception, you are conceptually throwing an exception within a function that has been marked as no except. So the program will invoke terminate just as in any other case you throw an exception inside a no except function. So here you have an example. I have function f, no except expect x uh, to be positive, and then you call with minus one. This invokes terminate. So putting a contract on a function that is no except is a, mis a mistake. Or putting no except on a function that has a narrow contract. John? I agree. <laughs> There's an exception. Something like swap, where it requires equal alligators, just deal with it. Okay, there are cases where you may want to do that. We are specifying what happens. But it's good advice. What you said. Yeah, yeah. I agree. If you want to test your code, that's a really good thing to do. Don't put no except on a narrow contract. Narrow meaning it has exclusion. Well, I, I don't fully agree because. Well, my opinion. Eh? My opinion. Okay, <laughs> not mine. Yeah, okay, okay. I learned from you, John. Let. <laughs> yes, it, I could. But then it the has not effect on, uh, on terminate. I'm taking one question and then you will leave me to go through the rest of my slides. I thought I had too few slides and I see I had too, ma too many. <laughs> Sorry? Yes, it is. It's a contract promising I'm not going to throw any exception at all. And now, let me go on and I, I will take questions at the end. So I have not so much, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, interfaces. You have seen this before, that you <laughs> If you repeat a contact, you have to use the same contact. Now, what else uh, do we have? Uh, preconditions on functions. The expression of a precondition from a function may use the function's argument and any non-local object. So here you see, you, you may use any argument and then any global concept or not. However, 
if your function is con consesper, you can only use non-local objects that are consesper, but you cannot use non-local objects that are non-consesper by definition of a consesper function. Uh, any modification or any observable modification on a contact is ill-formed. You cannot uh, perform, uh, have any side effect in a, in a contact. Now, why this is not always detectable? Let's say that I call here a function as a predicate that is in another translation unit and I don't have accessible the source code. Then I cannot, in general, prove it. So this is an error, but is, uh, the compiler is not always obliged to give me uh, such an error. Modified arguments on post condition. If a post condition uses an argument and the function body modifies that value, the program is ill-formed. So if you use a, an argument in a post condition, the body of the function cannot modify it. If you want to do something like that, you have a workaround of do not use a post condition and just use an assertion. And you can do it. Uh, a pointer value is different from the pointed value. So you can modify the content of the pointer. What you cannot change is the pointer itself. Contacts in templated function can also use uh, template arguments in the contact. Uh, what about visibility? The contact from a public function shall not use members from protected or private interfaces. And if you are a protected function, you cannot use the private interface. So you can use only the, the things that would be visible by your client at the call side. So that is the basic rule. So you assert, you would use assert inside the body of the function. Yes, or you would write a public function that encapsulates uh, the thing and then you can use it. Uh, you can set contacts also on lambda expressions. And, uh, we found already some use case when you pass the lambda uh, to, uh, to an algorithm. Uh, function pointers. Now, you cannot set a contact on a function pointer or a function pointer type. So don't do this. Okay, so function pointers cannot be annotated with contacts. Now, a function with a contract can be assigned to a function pointer without any problem. Okay, and the implementation is responsible in those cases to make sure that calls through the function pointer evaluate only once the contract. You don't want to repeat the evaluation at, bo uh, at both sides. Only once per call, Peter. Once per call. Okay. Yeah. Uh, inheritance. I was asked before about inheritance, and you will be probably not very happy. We have taken very strong rules here, and we plan to soften them in a future version. But for now, an overriding function shall have exactly the same contract in the base and in the derived class. So no precondition weakening, no postcondition strengthening. I know there is a full theory about uh, strengthening and weakening of precondition and postconditions. We are not going there for now. So if I write a function in the base class and then I redefine in the derived class, and I do not write the contact, there is no problem because I assume it's exactly the same contact. Now, I may repeat the contact, no problem. I can repeat explicitly the contact. But I cannot change the contact. This is an error. And 
I cannot add a contact to a function that didn't have a contact in the base class. Now, given all this, what do I do if I want to weaken a precondition, which is something that you might want to do? Well, you, might, you can always simulate by uh, keeping only the common part as an expectation and adding the uh, additional strong part in the base class as an assertion. And in the same way, you can strengthen a post condition by keeping the common part in the interface and the additional part, you add it uh, in the post condition as an assertion. So let me only one minute for some final notes. And I can take questions now or over lunch or whenever you want. Where's the implementation? <laughs> Sorry, not yet. Uh, we are selling down the last details and uh, we plan to start implementation. However, I recommend you to get ready with the C++ core guidelines support library, the GSL. Uh, so, this is an example of what you would write tomorrow, and this is what you can do today. So basically, you can use the GSL and the macros expects and ensures. So you put your expects at the start of your body, you put your ensures at the end of your body, and then later you will move, or your refactor. Peter will be happy to provide us a refactoring tool for making this transformation. So as conclusions, all this is about correctness, although it has some implications also in performance, safety, security. We have three new attributes, expect, ensure, and assert. Three assertions, default, audit, and axiom. Three build levels of default and audit a violation handler to be called when the contract is broken, two continuation modes, off and on, and do not forget to get ready with the GSL. And uh, you can still provide feedback. We are working on it. So if you have any idea, any feedback, any question, just drop me an email at josedaniel.garcia at uccm.es and I will be uh, happy to answer you. And this is all. I had 50 something slides, not the 400 you had yesterday, John, but still uh, I ran out of time. So thank you very much.